Thank you all for coming this evening. I'm David Goldman. I'm the director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism, which is part of Birkbeck in the University of, part of London, and the Pears Institute, along with the Institute of Historical Research, um, is um, a co-organizer of the event this, uh, this evening. Um, this is, in fact, the, uh, a second um, Holocaust Memorial Day event that the Pears Institute has organized in cooperation with the Institute of Historical Research. And, uh, and I'd like to thank the Institute of Historical Research for its practical and financial help and support um, I mean, putting on this important event, and it's really, uh, well, it's a model um, um, of, co of uh, cooperation in the University of London. The other great thanks um, ought to go to um, uh, Dr. Ludwig Brock, once of Birkbeck, but now of the University of, uh, of Bristol, whose um, um, uh, uh, whose idea this uh, event was, is, and who is its a principal inspiration and organizer. And um, we're all uh, um, in her debt. I think the numbers of you here indicate how um, appropriate um, uh, the memoirs and history of Jan Karski are for an occasion such as this. Um, I think it, it's a subject which fulfills both the need for remembrance and the need for a provocation to thought and reflection. And um, I have one other very mundane thing to say. Um, which is that I hope all of you will stay until the end of this evening's event. But if you feel you have to leave before the end, please leave by those doors over there and not by those doors over there. Those doors over there will land you in, a, in an abyss of nothingness. And, um, and you will not find your way out. But, so please, uh, please use at those doors. And um, apart from that, I'll just hand over to... Uh, hello and welcome to, to everyone. I want to thank you all for coming here uh, this evening, despite the cold. It's pretty harsh out there. Uh, thank you very much to David and Jan for their help in putting together this event, as well as to Miles Taylor. Thanks. I thank mostly uh, the three speakers who so graciously accepted our invitation to come and talk to us because not only will they be able to share their huge knowledge uh, of things about Jan Karski and around Jan Karski and his history and memory, but they're also, all of them, uh, very well-known names in 20th century history. So I'm very privileged to present on the end Professor Anthony Polonsky, Michael Berkovich and uh, Annette Fevorka. Now, before we start, since I'm holding the floor, I'm gonna keep it a while longer, and I won't let them speak quite yet. Um, I'd, I wanna talk a bit about uh, Jan Karski, just to introduce some of the ideas that really helped me put this event together and put us, us put this event together. So Jan Karski was a member of the Polish resistance um, already in uh, 1939. And amongst many other things that he accomplished, um, which we'll be discussing today, Karski met with Allied leaders in 42 and 43 to tell them about the extermination of European Jews. And now he had been smuggled into a ghetto and into a camp uh, in Poland to witness the horror and to tell this message to the world. Now, this, this message uh, and his experience in the ghetto and the camps are part of, the, part of Karski's stories which we may be the most familiar with. <laughs> uh, some of us may have seen Karski's breakdown in uh, the Shoah, Cloud Lesbian's Shoah, um, which actually I'll be showing you a clip of in uh, very shortly. 
as he recounts his meeting with the Jewish leaders in Poland and then later with, um, with the Allies. When, so when this Karski's intervention in Shoah happened in 1985, it was, he was interviewed a few years beforehand. But 25 years after uh, Shoah's release in 2009, a French novelist, Yannick Enel, <clears throat> based an entire book around Karski's encounter with Roosevelt in 1943. And his fictional interpretation of what happened during that meeting caused quite a big stir in, in France. And the book uh, received a prize, but it was quite contested nonetheless. So these were the ideas that I was thinking about uh, that awakened me to this really fascinating piece of history and memory that Jan Karski presents to us. The recent republication of Karski's memoirs here in Britain uh, by Penguin Classics reminds us of the need to revisit his history and his legacy. So I will show you the film briefly, uh, to start this uh, evening's event, and then we will let, and it will kind of give us a taster of what this whole evening is going to be about, uh, giving us what Karski is perhaps best known for, and then we'll start with Professor Anthony Polonsky, who will talk about the February 1940 report and its reception. Uh, Professor Polonsky is extremely uh, a, a kind of a dean of Polish and Jewish uh, history, and we're very happy to have him here. He recently published a three-volume history of Jews in Poland and Russia, which won a, a prize. I think the last volume is coming out this year, if I'm correct. This week. This week. Ah, excellent. Um, then following from that, Professor Michael Berkovich, who's actually a neighbor coming here from UCL, um, where he's a professor of modern Jewish history, will be talking to us about making sense of Karski's encounter with Felix Frankfurter. And Michael Berkovich was actually present when Claude Lanzmann last year came to Britain, came to London, to show an extended version of Karski's interview, which he'd made in 1978, 78, 79. So I, he will have some quite illuminating comments to make about that more extensive version of the interview. Uh, Annette Vyborka, finally, will talk about the Karski affair in France, but actually a post-war, the three Karskis, um, Karski in 1944 when he wrote the memoirs, Karski in 1985 when he was in uh, Shoah, and Karski in 2010 when this whole controversy in France around Hanel's fictional uh, book came about. So whilst I'm going to try and, and convert from this PowerPoint to, to the DVD player, hopefully. Okay, so while we're waiting to load this up, um, after this is going to last about 15 minutes. Afterwards, each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes time. And at the end of that, it will be question and answer time. This is an opportunity for us to have a more open discussion about what we've been talking about, maybe thoughts that you would like to bring to the table uh, about Jan Karski and his post-war legacy. Now, now I go back 35 years. No, I don't go back. service as a courier between the Polish underground 
and the Polish government in the exile in London. The Jewish leaders in Warsaw learned about it. A meeting was arranged outside of the ghetto. There were two gentlemen. They did not live in the ghetto. They introduced themselves. Leader of Bund, Zionist leader. Now, what transcribed, what happened in our conversation? First, I was not prepared for it. I was relatively isolated in my work in Poland. I did not see many things. In 35 years after the war, I don't go back. I have been a teacher for 26 years. I never mention the Jewish problem to my students. I understand this film. It's for historical record, so I will try to do it. They describe to me what is happening to the Jews. Did I know about it? No, I didn't. They describe to me first that the Jews, Jewish problem is unprecedented, cannot be compared with the Polish problem or Russian or any other problem. Hitler will lose this war but he will exterminate all Jewish population. Do I understand it? The Allies fight for their people. They fight for humanity. The Allies cannot forget that the Jews will be exterminated totally in Poland. Polish and European Jews. They were breaking down. They paced the room. They were whispering. They were hissing. It was a nightmare for me. Did they look in complete desperation? Yes. Yes, at various stages of the conversation, they lost control of themselves. I just sat in my chair. I just listened. I did not even react. I didn't ask them questions. I was just listening. Well, and then they... They wanted to convince you to convey... They realized, I think, they realized from the beginning that I don't know, that I don't understand this problem. Once I said I will take messages from them, they wanted to inform me what is happening to the Jews. And I didn't know this. I was never in a ghetto. I never dealt with the Jewish matters. And did you know yourself at the time that most of the Jews of Warsaw had already been killed? I did know, but I didn't see anything. I never heard any description of what is happening over there. I was never there. It is one thing to know statistics. There were hundreds of thousands of Poles also killed, of Russians, Serbs, Greeks. We knew about it. But it was a question of statistics. But did they insist about the complete uniqueness of the... Of yes, the this was their problem. To impress upon me, and then was my mission, to impress upon all people whom I am going to see, that the Jewish situation is unprecedented in history. Egyptians, Egyptian pharaohs did not do it. Babylonians did not do it. 
Now for the first time in history, actually, they came to the conclusion, unless the Allies take some unprecedented steps, regardless of the outcome of the war, the Jews will be totally exterminated. And they cannot accept it. This means that they ask for a very specific yes for the... So then, interchangeably, at a certain point, the Bund leader, at a certain point, the Zionist leader, then what do they want? What message am I supposed to take? Then they gave me messages, various messages, to the Allied governments as such. I was to see as many government officials as I could, as I could, of course. Then to the Polish government, then to the president of the Polish Republic, then to the international Jewish leaders, and to individual political leaders, leading intellectuals, approach as many people as possible. And then they gave me segments. To whom do I report what? So now, in this nightmarish, two meetings I had with them, nightmarish meetings, well then they presented their demands, separate demands. The message was, Hitler cannot be allowed to continue extermination. Every day comes. The Allies cannot treat this war only from purely military strategic standpoint. They will win the war if they take such an attitude. But what good will it do to us? We will not survive this war. The Allied governments cannot take such a stand. We contributed to humanity. We gave scientists for thousands of years. We originated great religions. We are humans. Do you understand it? Do you understand it? It never happened before in history what is happening to our people now. Perhaps it will shake the conscience of the world. <coughs> we understand. We have no country of our own. We have no government. We have no voice in the Allied Councils. So we have to use services, little people like you are. Will you do it? Will you approach them? Will you fulfill your mission? Approach the Allied. We want an official declaration of the Allied Nations that in addition to 
to the military strategy, which aims at securing victory, military victory in this war. Extermination of the Jews forms a separate chapter And the Allied nations formally, publicly announce that they would deal with this problem, that it becomes a part of their overall strategy in this world. Not only the defeat of Germany, but also saving the remaining Jewish population. Once they make such an official declaration, they have the Air Force. They drop bombs on Germany. Why cannot they drop millions of leaflets? Informing the German population exactly what their government is doing to the Jews. Perhaps they don't know it. No. Let them make official declaration, again official, public declaration that if the German nation does not offer evidence of trying to change the policy of their government, German nation will have to be held responsible for the crimes their government is committing. And now, if there are not such an evidence to announce publicly, officially, Certain objects in Germany will be bombed, destroyed. As a retaliation for what the German government is doing against the Jews. That bombing which will take place is not a part of the military strategy. It deals only with the Jewish problem. Let the German people know before bombing takes place and after bombing takes place that this was done and will continue to be done because the Jews are being exterminated in Poland. Perhaps it will help. They can do it. This they can do. here. Um, this snippet is um, probably the most, like I said earlier, the, the part that we know most about Karski. Um, and the speakers will now help us to overturn some of the stones and look at what's underneath, what was happening before, at the time of, 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 of uh, the interview in Shoah, and later in the 21st century, what's happening now in France. Um, so I will... Uh, you can stay seated, yeah, there's no problem. So I'll now give the floor to uh, Anthony. Ludovine showed this extract because I knew Jan Karski quite well. I would even say that he was a friend. And this was exactly what he was like. He was certainly one of the great heroes of the Second World War. He was a man of impeccable honesty and a man of great moral uh, sincerity. And I think that emerged clearly from the film. But he was also a very complicated individual, an individual who was really tortured, and you can see this in his face. Why? 
I think that he was torn between two objectives to which he devoted his life. The one was his desire, his sympathy for the suffering Jewish people and his desire to bring to the world the suffering. And the other was his need as a patriotic Pole, as a member of the Polish underground, as somebody working for the Polish government in London, to defend the interests of Poland and to do what his government told him to do. And he often found that these two objectives were in conflict with each other. And he says this and makes this clear on a number of occasions in the script, in this film interview which we looked at. Let me start by saying, making one point. He says in the interview, I knew nothing about what was happening to the Jews. This, of course, is not correct. In 1940, he was sent by the Polish underground. He was recruited very early. He was the brother of a prominent member of the Warsaw police. He was himself trained for the diplomatic service. He was in the Polish underground even before it was called the Home Army, when it was still the ZWZ, Związek Walki Czynnej. And he went around Poland report, investigating the nature of the German and Soviet occupations. And he went around with somebody who was sent to him by his brother, a, a Jewish member of the Warsaw Police, a convert. But he was, as a result of this, able to go beyond what he had been deputed to do by the Polish government. That is to say, he reported in this uh, message which he took to the Polish government, which at that stage was in Angers, in uh, France, on the situation of the Jews. In that report, it's too long to go into it in any detail, he concluded with the following statement. He headed it, the present danger of the Jewish question. The solution of the Jewish question, in quotation marks, by the Germans. I must state this with a full sense of responsibility for what I am saying, is a serious and quite dangerous tool in the hands of Germans leading towards the moral pacification of broad sections of Polish society. It would certainly be erroneous to suppose that this issue alone will be effective in gaining for them the acceptance of the population. However, although the nation loathes them mortally, this question is creating something akin to a narrow bridge upon which the Germans and a large portion of Polish society are finding agreement. He took this report to the, to the uh, Prime Minister of the Government in Exile, General Vladislav Sikorsky, the Minister of Information, Stanislav Ostroinsky, and uh, his assistant, uh, Minister Jan Kot. They didn't like this report, and they told Karski to rewrite the report. We know this because the two drafts of the report which we have, which are in the Polish government papers, which are now housed in the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, are both written in Jan Karski's handwriting. He rewrote it as follows. The solution of the Jewish question by the Germans, this must be stated with, full, with a full sense of responsibility, is supposed in their hands and according to their plans to be a serious and quite dangerous tool, whether for winning over or for morally pacifying broad sections of the Polish society. They are not succeeding in this objective. At this moment, it is difficult to say to what extent the Germans understand that the group which supports them is not large and will in the course of time be even smaller. What did he feel when he was told to write the direct opposite of what he had actually reported to the government? He clearly felt considerable anger, and the anger emerges in this discussion. The same was true in the period when he went back to Poland. As everybody knows, he uh, was arrested by the Germans. He managed to escape after attempting suicide, and he continued to report, and he gave this second report, of which the report on the situation in the ghetto is a part. But before that, he was closely associated with people who were in the uh, organization which was providing help to the Jews uh, under the code name Zygota. The two principal people with whom he worked in that organization were Zofia Kosak-Szczutska and Vladislav Bienkowski. 
They were very noble individuals, but they were people who had no strong feelings for Jews. On the contrary, Zofia Kosak Schutzka was a pre war anti Semite who, in a famous protest in which she called on Jews, on Poles to assist Jews, both as Catholics because of the obligation to love thy neighbor as thyself, and as Poles because otherwise the Poles would be classed in the same category as those who were assisting the Germans, like the Lithuanians or the Ukrainians. She said, We still regard the Jews as our enemies. Why they hate us so much, we cannot understand. This was not Karski's position. Karski came from a socialist background. He never had uh, any uh, reservations about seeing the Jews as fully human and as citizens of the Polish state. And so when he came out and gave the second report, he knew that attitudes in Polish society, far from changing, had got towards the Jews significantly worse. In addition, the second report uh, although he says in this uh, discussion which he filmed in this uh, interview which he filmed in 1979 that his main task was to bring to the world the fate of the Jews the main obligation imposed upon him by the Polish government was to bring home to the allies the desperate uh, diplomatic situation of the Poles and to win support for the Polish claim to independence, which the Poles had a very uh, real case for. Uh, I wrote a book about this. I haven't got time to describe the complexities of the Polish question during the Second World War. Karski was a spokesman for the Polish government, and we certainly betrayed that uh, Polish government, and Karski knew this very well. He did also deal with the Jewish question, but he dealt with it rather tangentially, and we know this because in the post-war period, Karski never wrote, about, as he says in these interviews, about the Jewish question. He doesn't mention the report which I cited here in his uh, memoirs, uh, the, the memoirs of a Secret State, which has just been republished, and he never discussed it in the post-war period. Instead, he wrote a major monograph on the great powers in Poland, 1918 to uh, 45. And every time I used to meet him until he got involved with uh, 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 Lanzmann, he used to say to me, why are people not reviewing this book? This book should be reviewed because it will tell people how Poland was betrayed. He came back to the, Pol to the Jewish issue for two reasons, or as a result of two developments. The first was his marriage. He married a Jewish ballerina, uh, uh, Paula Nirenska, and they were a devoted couple, uh, and indeed she subsequently developed terminal cancer, and after her uh, death at her own hands, he endowed a prize for the person in Poland every year, the Paula Nirenska Prize, who does the most to uh, make known uh, the nature and uh, history of uh, Jews in Poland. So partly it was from his wife, but partly it was also Lanzmann. In the material which was prepared for the session today, it says that uh, Karski was deeply disturbed that Shoah, the film Shoah, uh, failed to acknowledge the work of the Polish nation in helping the Jews. This is not correct. He was very much influenced by Lanzmann, a very difficult individual, I may say, but a great filmmaker, as this film shows. And when I organized the first showing of Shoah in this country, which was in Oxford in 1985, he phoned me to say how important it was to show this film and how he would very much like also to be present. A number of uh, well-known Polish literary and historical figures were present on that occasion, but that for various reasons he couldn't be there. He gave an interview to Maciej Kozlowski, a well-known correspondent for the leading Polish Catholic weekly, Tygodnik Powszechny, in which he described his attitude to the film Shoah. This was published in Polish. It was then published in Dissent. When I organized, uh, when I edited a volume devoted to uh, Polish debates about the Holocaust, as which were provoked by the um, uh, uh, article published by Jan Blonsky, Biedni Polacy Pacho na ghetto, the poor Poles look at the ghetto, he told me, you must publish my interview. And so I'm going to conclude with a few sentences from that interview, which do tell us both about Karski's own position and his attitude to the film Shoah. This is what uh, Maciej Kozlowski said to ask him, after the war, after publishing your book, you disappeared from the public scene. Many people thought you had died. You came back to the part of your life in Lanzmann's, to that part of your life in Lanzmann's film. Why did you decide to speak up after so many years? Karski. I was persuaded by Claude Lanzmann. He is a difficult man, 
very emotional, <coughs> obsessed with his film. He has spent 11 years making it. At first I refused, but Lanzmann persuaded me. He told me that it was my duty to speak. And finally, I consented with the remarkable results which we've seen. And those who haven't seen the entire two hours of this uh, uh, interview, which of course have been made available separately, should certainly see them. Maciej Kozlowski, did you regret it after seeing the film? Shaw has aroused much controversy. Lanzmann has been criticized for presenting a biased view and for distorting historical truth by the selective way he chose those he interviewed. Karski. I do not agree with such opinions. Lanzmann made a great film, but a large part of the Polish press, both in Poland and abroad, did not understand his intentions. It is a film about the Holocaust, about it alone and nothing else. Even the war is, is merely mentioned in it. There are no political issues. Lanzmann told me he was interested in interviewing three categories of people, the Jews who lived through the Holocaust, those who were instigators, and the witnesses. Most of those who saw the Holocaust were, and, uh, saw the, were Poles, and they were not intellectuals, city dwellers and educated persons, but peasants and people from small cities who lived close to the death camps. And it is not Lanzmann's fault that they are presented in the way that they are. He does not speak Polish. He did not uh, instruct them how and what to say. Mart Maciej Kozlowski. But among the witnesses, there were also decent people without resentment against Jews. There was a special cell in the home army, Zagota, concerned only with helping the persecuted Jews. There were hundreds of Poles who helped Jews at the risk of their own lives. You do not, un Karski, you do not understand, want to understand either. Lanzmann made a film about the mechanism of the Holocaust, not about the Poles or any other nation's attitude to the Jews but not about the efforts to help. Therefore, he took only a part from my interview, which lasted for many hours, my testimony from the ghetto in Belgius. The film is a masterpiece. It was a sensation not only in the United States, but in the whole world, even among Poles, after their first hysterical reactions, after trumped up charges and exaggerated figures concerning help given to Jews during the war, some sobriety was evident, especially among those who had seen the entire film. I think this is the message which Karski would want us to hear today. Karski believed that you should criticize the behavior of your own people, whoever they were, and that you should stand up for human dignity, whoever the human dignity, whoever human dignity it is. He was a great man and a great Pope. Thank you. I realize it's very difficult to talk about something that most likely um, at least some of, this pe some of the people in this room haven't seen, but maybe just a very easy show of hands. Um, can I just see, are there people in this audience who have seen the uh, part of the interview with Jan Karski that Claude Lonsman has been showing as he's speaking about the current controversy and um, sort of the afterlife of the film? Is there anyone here who has seen this? Yes? No, just a few people? Okay, so I'm going to be describing uh, um, something, and thankfully I do have a small part of, um, of a transcript, but I don't have the entire transcript. Claude Lanzmann appeared at UCL several months ago, and one of his main reasons for coming, if I understand this correctly, is to show a part of Shoah, which he decided not to include in the film, which he joked was long enough, um, it actually is quite a long film, but there were actually other reasons why he decided not to show it. Um, it was, though, very, very interesting, and this is what um, I'm going to be addressing. So what I would like to do, and I don't have very long comments, but do basically two things. That is, talk about the incident itself, and then talk about how it was, um, um, how, how it's been appropriated, and also about uh, Lanzmann's decision not to use it, which I think was actually um, quite wise in a number of ways, but then to give some sense, uh, if, if you do happen to see it, or if this controversy does go on, to say something about the major figure who I think has been not treated either very well or very historically in this process, and that's Felix Frankfurter. 
So let me just say, uh, uh, the part that um, Lonsman showed, and I think he showed about 20 minutes or so of the interview with Karski, it actually has a very different tone than this interview that you've seen. And maybe, you know, uh, um, I can be corrected or some others could say that they see it a little bit differently. That is, he's more relaxed, he's more confident, and maybe even a little bit more cocky or, you know, full of himself that he was this young man and talking to very important figures. And one of the things that Lonsman said is that he wasn't sure that he wanted to show this side of him that uh, it, just, it just didn't work nearly as well as the first part. And there was another, another problem with it, though. Um, and I'd say it wasn't a matter of style or aesthetics. That is that Karski talked about being in a specific camp, and it was probably wrong. He didn't have the correct information. Actually, at the time, he didn't actually know where he had been. So he identified himself as having been at the Belzec camp. So Lanzmann was aware that this probably wasn't correct, and he didn't want to have something in the film itself that could clearly be flagged as simply not being possible, or you know, it could be proven that he wasn't there. And again, it was a matter of simply not having the not having information. I think this is also part of the reason why a long interview that Karski gave, which was very similar to the interview that wound up on the cutting room floor, but thankfully we haven't, it, it's never been published. There's only one version of it that I've, that I've been able to track down. It exists in a bound volume, but only published privately, and it's in the library of American University in Washington, D.C. Again, only one copy of it, and there are only a few references to it. Only a couple of scholars have tracked it down. But what I want to do is um, to read from a small section of it and then say a little bit more about Felix Frankfurter. Um, and this is, this is from one of the accounts. Uh, it, I should also say there was a little bit of a problem here with this account compared to the way that um, Karski tells it with Lanzmann. He makes it sound as if it's between himself and Felix Frankfurter. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that most people have some idea of, uh, of who Felix Frankfurter is. Of course, he wound up being a United States Supreme Court justice. Figure was very close to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But in this interview, which was given probably a little bit after his interview with um, Claude Lonsman, it makes it so it's more triangular. It's between himself and the Polish ambassador and Felix Frankfurter. So it already has a little bit of a different character, but the gist of it is the same. The gist is the same. Okay, and I'll read from it. Frankfurter rose, stared down at Jan Karski. It's kind of interesting, actually, he's referring to himself in the third person here. Um, a man like me talking to a man like you, he said, must be totally honest. So I am. So I say, I do not believe you. Felix, the ambassador cried. Felix, how can you say such a thing? You know he is saying the truth. He was checked and rechecked in London and here. Felix, what are you saying? I did not say that he's lying, Frankfurter replied. I said that I don't believe him. There is a difference. Okay, um, in the interview that Karski gives with Lonsman, that's where it stops. He quotes him as saying, I'm not saying that he's lying. I said that I don't believe him. But in this version of the interview we gave a little bit longer, there are a couple more lines. Karski said that he could not forget the scene of Frankfurter saying, my mind, my heart, they are made in such a way that I cannot conceive it. And stretching out his arms and crying, no, no, no. That part isn't included in the interview. Well, one of the things that's happened to this interview is that it's been used in this novel 
And it's also been picked up by people who want to score political points and even sort of political religious points from this period, from this particular incident. And there is something of an ax to grind. Obviously, this is very complicated historical problems. But um, there is a group of, I'd say, some scholars and publicists who are very interested in making the case that Roosevelt could care less about the Jews and the Jews who were close to him were completely duped or else they themselves were completely cold or didn't really care about the fate of the Jews of Europe. And this is partly what's happened. A sort of caricature has emerged of, um, of Felix Frankfurter in this imagination that occurs in this novel. And I think in many respects, it, it, it doesn't really work. I Most likely, something like this second version actually did happen where he says, you know, he's saying, I, do, I don't believe you, but I'm not saying you're lying by saying, I don't believe you. What he's saying is he, he simply cannot accept that this is happening and that it doesn't fit in to his view of the world and particularly his view of what um, Germany would be capable of. And that's what I want to, um, that's what I want to address. Just a, um, a, a few minutes about Felix Frankfurter himself. Frankfurter has basically con been conflated into a figure very much like Louis Brandeis. That is that he's been seen as being this paragon of a German Jewish establishment. And although he was a German speaker himself. He actually came from quite a different background. He was a lot younger than Louis Brandeis, and Brandeis referred to him as, as sort of his half-brother, half-son. But it was, in, in some ways, a little bit of um, a difficult relationship as well. Felix Frankfurter was born in Vienna in 1882, and he immigrated with his family to the United States in 1894. That is, he was 12 years old. His family was not very well off. They were from sort of a notoriously poor part of Vienna. They certainly weren't the poorest of the poor, but they weren't um, anywhere near middle class either. So he was, um, we could say he was a German, actually an Austrian. He writes about uh, a wonderful teacher we had in school who insisted that he stop speaking German because there were lots of other people who would speak German with him that he had to learn, uh, um, that he learned English. Um, his father was a fur merchant. He did okay, but not terribly well. One of the things that Frankfurter tried to do was, although the school was really pretty good that he was going to, he took an exam to get into the illustrious Horace Mann School, and he didn't quite do well enough to get a full scholarship, but he did well enough that they called him back for an interview, and they said, we'll give you half. If your family can pay half, then we will let you do it, but they didn't quite have um, enough for that as well. So they were from the Lower East Side. They were not immediately from one of the more uh, um, uh, one of the more trendy areas. And he attended the City College of New York. From there, he went to Harvard Law School. But in between, he worked for the City of New York, actually for the Tenement Council, and he played around a little bit. He thought he would stay in New York. He originally attended New York Law School, which he decided wasn't very serious. He went to NYU Law School, despite it being such a great place now. He thought it was, that also wasn't a very serious place. He was going to go to Columbia. He, was, he got a little sidetracked. He wound up going to Harvard later on. Well, he did really well at Harvard, not surprisingly. He got taken into a New York firm, which was famous for not having Jews, one of these things that has great resonance for people in New York, that is Hornblower, Byrne, Miller, and Potter. That is a firm that up to that point had had no Jews. Really quite incredible. But he did something that was unusual for somebody who graduates at the top of his class of Harvard Law School. He leaves after a year in order to serve as an assistant United States attorney under Henry, Henry Stimson. When Stimson was appointed Secretary of War by President William Howard Taft, he requested that Frankfurter join him as his assistant. My dear friend and colleague Howard Sacher has written that Frankfurter relished the appointment. He, say he calls him a little dynamo, endlessly inquisitive. 
He enjoyed picking people's brains for information and ideas. Well, in Washington, Frankfurter came to be friendly with Louis Brandeis. Brandeis helped Frankfurter secure a position on Harvard's law faculty in 1914. Frankfurter achieved a reputation as a challenging teacher and as a courageous liberal activist. He sent his most brilliant students on to clerk for Brandeis for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, again, he was quite close to him. Again, this famous term is half-brother, half-son that Brandeis himself used. He became friendly with Franklin Roosevelt. That is, Frankfurter became friendly with Franklin Roosevelt quite early, around 1906. They were friendly off and on. They wrote a little bit, and then they became quite close in the late 1920s, particularly uh, around the time that Roosevelt was elected governor of New York, and then he became one of his closest political advisors. Now, to say just a little bit more about um, Felix Frankfurt, he was, he's a very interesting character. He wasn't of the same kind of liberal activist mode as Brandeis. He was somewhat more restrained and his legacy has not had the kind of luster of Brandeis, even though I'd say what's happened politically is the legacy of both of these people has really been sort of systematically undermined for decades now. But I think that he was um, very sharp, but he was also quite cautious and aware of limits. I think one of the cases he's most famous for now is a 1948 McCollum case, and this probably will have a lot more significance for Americans. This was around the issue of can a, what we call in America, a public school, a state school, allow time for students to pray on their own? That is, of course, not telling them what they should do, but simply to give them the time to do it. And his answer was, Absolutely no, absolutely not. That the separation between church and state means that you do not include this as part of a school curriculum. So he was really quite consistent, I think in a lot of ways a, a really brilliant mind, probably one of the most important figures in the American legal world. He cared about Jews. He took a big chance by being as active in the Zionist movement as he was. He certainly didn't um, um, turn his back. He was, he was very well informed as he probably did whatever he could do. And again, I would like to quote uh, um, Howard Socher about this question of those who are close to um, those who are close to Roosevelt. And he said, "Were these Jewish intercessors wrong then?" in their conviction that Roosevelt, for all his dissembling and equivocation, was the Jews' last best hope. He says, they were not wrong. Almost any other occupant of the White House would have been worse for their people. In coping with Nazi brutality, as in coping with the Depression, Roosevelt was the single fragile reed they had left. Well, David Wyman and others have made the case or tried to make the case that Frankfurter, along with others, including Stephen S. Wise, although in his um, earlier work, it worked, um, even Wyman is a little bit more equivocal on this, they're saying that they did not advocate rescue as they could have. But I think what gets confused here is the notion that was so widely shared that the most important thing was for the Allies to win the war as quickly as possible. And that this would be the way to alleviate, uh, um, this would be the way to alleviate the Jews' distress. So I think part of the reason why um, Lanzmann, we can say, well, he's a difficult man, but part of the reason why he was so agitated about how this has been used and misused is he thought it simply didn't do justice all the way around to a number of figures. And I think one of the people who's been lost in this, and there are just all sorts of, um, I say, not very historical or well-grounded things appearing, is Felix Frankfurter. 
Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am the, the last to speak, uh, and I want uh, first uh, make a remark about this strange situation that Jan Karski is now well known in France, <laughs> a country which was not his country. His books, his memoirs, has been translated just after the, the war in 1945. The secret state was translated for the first time uh, at uh, that period. Then it was published a second time in the 90s, then republished just now. And uh, just when I left, it was published in paper book. So it's uh, quite an important book for French people. One reason why Jan Karski is quite a well-known figure in France is, of course, Claude Lanzmann's film, Shoah. It was quite a revelation to see this man telling uh, the story of his meeting with the Zionist leader and the Buddhist leader, and then the visit of Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, the way he describes the ghetto is one of the most moving part of Shoah and one of the most moving description of what was the life in Warsaw Ghetto after the great action, after the, the deportation of uh, more than 300,000 Jews from the uh, ghetto. Then, to, uh, in, uh, in the late years, a novel was published, which title was Jan Karski. I don't know if it has, it has been translated into English. No, no. So, I fully agree with uh, Anthony Polonsky. There are two Karskis and there are three moments in uh, the reception of uh, Jan Karski. Three narratives. The first one, 1944-19. 45 is the moment where Karski's memoirs were published. For everybody, it was at that time obvious that Jan Karski was a Polish patriot or nationalist without any uh, pejorative uh, uh, meaning, concerned by the state of his country. He was fighting for a free Poland, first against Nazi occupiers, occupants, then against Soviet Union. And his main task was to make the allies conscient about the situation of his country. If you read Secret State, his memoir, you will note that only 10 or 15 pages dealt with the question of the extermination of Polish, Polish jury. Then, I think that it's possible to say that Karski fight 
for the independence of Poland failed. And that during 26 years, as he said in the film, he was not obsessed with the Jewish question. He was not obsessed by the Warsaw Ghetto. He put it on the side and he go on fighting for his own country. I think that it's not abnormal. At that time, nobody was concerned with the Holocaust. Jan Karski was not an exception. In the novel, uh, <coughs> which is not translated into English, the author imagines Karski spending days and days in the library of Congress reading any book on the Holocaust. At that time, there were only a couple of books of the Holocaust, and it was impossible to spend months or days reading uh, this kind of books. You have the story, this story written by Recklinger, the English guy, one of a French well-known historian, Léon Polyakov, Brévière de la Haine, and it was all. Raoul Berg had to wait the Eichmann trial to have his master book, The Destruction of European Jewry, published. 1985, the second Karski. This year, the 80s and 90s, were the years of the emergence of the history and the memory of the Holocaust. It became very important in public space. Lanzmann had finished his nine hour and a half hours film. You have the publication of Mars of Art Spiegelman. And uh, during these years, I met Anthony Polosky. <laughs> we were uh, a few scholars uh, trying to shape this field. Now we are and numerous scholars in that field. So, Karski's narrative was part of Lanzmann's narrative about Shoah. There was no point to put in this film the second part of the interview because it was another subject, the subject of what the allies did to help Jews. Third moment, this year's, the context had radically changed. The genocide of the Jews or the Holocaust is now part of European imagination. Novels, films, memorials, comics, are dealing with this subject. Some of them are chefs d'oeuvre, like Shoah or Mouse. <coughs> this chef d'oeuvre, this masterpiece, took to the, to the author years and years, more than 10 years, for Shoah, 13 years for Art Spiegelman Maus. But we have a lot of novels, very quickly written, some successful, other unsuccessful. But the air du temps, the spirit of time, had changed. And I want to stress three 
uh, three fields where we can <coughs> see many change. First of them, Jews and Poles. Poland is now part of European Union. And for a lot of people, it's time to get rid of what they considered sometimes are as stereotypes, the antisemitism of Polish population. Now, a very important museum is uh, in construction on the place of Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, it's time for a lot of persons to say that everything is going well between Jews and Paul. The second theme is the silence of the allies. It's now in my country, but I guess that it's the same here and maybe in the States, that the allies knew in details what was going on with the Jews, and they did nothing. Now, it's very common to accuse the allies to be responsible of the Holocaust. It's a kind of topoi. And uh, it's very often that people explain what the allies should have done. For example, for example, uh, bombarding the rails conducted to Auschwitz. Now, states and England are considered as co-responsible of the destruction of European Jewry. The third theme, which is now very current, is uh, uh, the meaning of Nuremberg's trial. In the book, uh, in the novel I uh, spoke about, it's written that the, the Nuremberg trial was set up with only one aim <coughs> to hide the responsibilities of uh, allies in the world and in the genocide, that it was a kind of veil put by the allies on genocide. And you have numerous uh, TV programs, books, explaining what was this aim of Nuremberg trial. So I'm going to finish there. Of course, I don't agree with these uh, three new themes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much to the uh, three speakers. I think it's very interesting how we can all, we, we started with Anthony Polonsky and finished with Annette Yavorka, but we could have almost gone the other way around with how the question of, you know, what the Allies did to help the Jews, how it's become a kind of rising obsession, especially in France, then Michael answering it some way by showing how, you know, Amer well, American di Americans didn't turn their back, this kind of myth that they turned their back on the Jews at the time. And coming almost to uh, uh, originally the first, the first talk about how much does the Jewish question appear in Karski's own personal trajectory from 1940 until after Shoah. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor, thank you very much, and um, to any questions that you may have. Uh, yes, first one here. I'm just confused about the date of that meeting with the Frankfurter in Washington. When was that? Are we, are we talking about um, 42, or are we talking about after the film was made? Um, when the when you, you talked about a meeting with Felix Frankfurter when right. he says, "I don't believe you," when was that? No, um, Phil, well, Felix Frankfurter dies in 1965, 
Uh, um, so what we're what we're talking about is after Karski is on his. Do, do you know the exact date? Because yes. this is what I tried to find. Know the exact date of his meeting with Frankfurter. July the fifth. With July the fifth. Okay. Uh, um, this is this is forty-two. Yeah, forty-two. Okay. Um, it, it, okay, I'm trying to. Um, so Roosevelt we're. we're was excuse me. Roosevelt was twenty-eight. Roosevelt was twenty-eight. Okay. Um, so we're talking about his his uh, his trip to the United States after this after this meeting. I, I you know, like soon a, soon after that. Soon after that meeting. After what he was there. What well, this is why I'm confused. He was Karski was there. With Jan, Jan Chekhanovetsky, the Polish ambassador, who was a tennis partner of Frankfurter, yes. persuaded Frankfurter to meet Karski, yes. who was then 30, 26, 27, uh, something like that, and. Uh, the idea was that Karski would tell Frankfurter, as one of the most senior Jewish figures in the administration, what was going on, and that this would have this impact. I think that, I mean, Karski tells the story much later, and in the, uh, Wojciech may correct me on this, but in the secret state, Frankfurter does not appear. Uh, and I think that he was, he may have thought about this a lot, but obviously memory is treacherous. And I'm sure that what Frankfurter was saying was, there's the difference between knowing something and internalizing something. And for Frankfurter, born in Vienna, the idea that the Germans could undertake this sort of crime was inconceivable. Maybe he expressed himself uh, not very satisfactorily. One wonders how good Karski's English was in 1942. I mean, Karski was a gifted linguist, but people in Poland studied French as a first foreign language. Whether he actually said, I cannot believe you, uh, one, one, we don't know. Uh, sorry, but uh, the French uh, philosopher Raymond Aron, who was in London uh, with uh, the Free French yeah. during uh, the war, told exactly the same. Yeah. And he was a Jew, and uh, he explained, I, I knew things, but uh, as far as I did not understand it, I did not know yes. it. And it was the same feeling, that it was inconceivable, even for, for a Jew, and but even if you have the information. Karski came back to this. It was a exact. It's a Freud talks about the uh, traumatic surfacing of memory, and obviously this is what happened. And some of the things that he says clearly don't fit reality. When he says, "I didn't know about this," the report of 1940 mm -hmm. is extremely detailed. I don't have the opportunity here. I published this report in a book I edited with Norman Davies. The report is extremely detailed. He describes graphically in 1939 the persecution of Jews, how the Jews are outside the law, how they are uh, being uh, forced into forced labor, and at the end of this will be something like mass murder. I mean, he doesn't predict mass murder, but but he mm. comes close to it. So the idea that, that he this wasn't central in his mind is very unlikely. The fact is also he was in constant contact with Zofia kosak Schutzka. Now, Zofia kosak Schutzka is a very enigmatic figure. There's a very good biography of her by Carlo Tonini in Italian. Uh, but in her newspaper, uh, Pravda, which was uh, the newspaper of this front, Odrodzenia Narodovego, the Catholic opposition uh, and underground movement, she refers, to, you, you find the first reference to Yedwabne, the massacre of mm. Jews in the small northeastern Polish town. It's true, she calls it not Yedwabne, but Jagodne. And Karski was almost certainly aware of this. In the report, Karski says, uh, describes the situation in the Soviet occupation, 1940. And there he says that Jews are comfortable under the Soviet occupation. And he said it's true that Jewish communists adopted an enthusiastic stance towards the Bolsheviks, where, while the Jewish proletariat, small merchants and artisans, and all those whose position has at present been structurally improved, all these are responding positively to the new regime. And he goes on and says this is quite understandable, although there are cases of collaboration. But he also says... In principle, however, and in their mass, 
The situation is that in the eyes of the Poles, the Jews have created a situation where the Poles regard them as devoted to the Bolsheviks and, one can safely say, wait for the moment when they will be able simply to take their revenge upon the Jews. Virtually all Poles are bitter and disappointed in relation to the Jews. The overwhelming majority, first among them, of course, the youth, literally look forward to an opportunity for repayment in blood. So to me it's inconceivable, maybe Wojciech has a better knowledge of this because he's doing a PhD on this subject. Um, it's inconceivable to me that he didn't know about the wave of anti-Jewish violence in northeastern Poland. He was aware of all of this. He wasn't sure how to bring it into the public. Yeah, um, if I could just add, if, if I could just add one thing, one of the reasons, and you would usually think that, well, someone who is um, as eminent as Felix Frankfurter, and you know there are these very detailed biographies of almost anyone who's been on the United States Supreme Court, but something rather freakish happened. Um, a bundle of his diaries were stolen at one point. So biographers and you know scholars have had a hard time reconstructing the kinds of things that are usually very easy to do for lawyers, you know, who keep very careful logs. But we do have some uh, we do have some gaps, and I think that this is part of the reason why it didn't appear as um, as part of the record, and also I think why um, why Frankfurter has been as slippery as um, as he has been. Although obviously there are lo there are lots of letters, his own materials are unusually fragmentary for someone who lived in in that time period. So again, this I, what part of it was, uh, and I'm thankful to uh, um, to Wojcik for giving us the dates. But this is something I thought that would be easily available, and it, and it simply wasn't easily available. So we've got one question oh, over sorry. there in the back. Hello. Uh, yeah. I myself a Paul, living in Britain, and then I know quite a lot history, yeah, and. This is supposed to be the tema about the Jan Karski, yeah? And I, I can see here is we going too much in the details. I think the one question, very important question, which I would like to give, what uh, you as professors here, you think, uh, because I tried to, because me, myself, I was uh, trying to imagine when I was the Jan Karski, and if I went there to this concentration uh, lager, and I, if I went to uh, ghetto, I was risking my life to give the message to the world, to help the Jews, yeah? And then later on, I have to be smuggled from Poland and going to, let's say, to London to speak to, uh, like, uh, governments. But everyone knows it's not easy to speak to the gov government, yeah? So it's the time, it's that, that war. You need to speak to other people how to get. So he was uh, working very hard to give this message to the uh, uh, in America everywhere. Why this message? Th they received the message. Why they didn't do enough to help the Jews? Uh, I wanted to know the question because there was some uh, insinuation like they should maybe bomb the rail railway. They maybe sh uh, should probably I don't know like around the. Concentration camp like that. They should be the bomb. They should bombing the area so that they would be. They could stop the Jews being deported to this concentration camp like that. Why the Allies? They didn't do enough. This is the. I think the most important question because this person, I don't know if he is still alive, but it's a bit like he did this great job. But I think what he need to be. He was sad for the rest of his life that he went with this message to all over the world, but it didn't work. The message went there, but it's like you speak to someone, he hear you, but it's nothing. So I think after he was a very sad person, because he wanted to like help the Jews, he couldn't, yeah? So it's like, why the Allies? What was the reason? Why the Allies? They didn't want to, and they didn't want to do enough to help the Jews. Yes, okay. I, let me I'll try and answer this. The first thing, I, I would say that Karski was not the only person who brought information about what was happening. 
The Bund had sent material through the Polish uh, network in Stockholm. Material had come from uh, Palestinian Jews who were in Europe who were exchanged for German prisoners in Palestine. There was a uh, information coming from Gerhard Riegner in Geneva, who got information from a German uh, industrialist who was sympathetic. There was a, 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 a Swedish consul in what's now Szczecin, Szczecin then, uh, who, a man called Wendel, who provided information. There was a lot of information. By 1942, middle of 1942, uh, the Allies knew that the Nazis were embarked on a genocide. So the question is, it's not only Karski, the question is more generally, as you say, why did they not do more? The problem is, what could they do? The, it's true they could have bombed the railway lines to Auschwitz, but it was only clear sometime late in 1943, early 1944, that Auschwitz was a main extermination camp. If we think about, or death camp, if we think about the mass murder of Jews in Poland, much more important in that not too many Polish Jews were killed in, in Auschwitz. The people who died in Auschwitz were Hungarians, people from the rest of Europe, French, uh, Slovaks, uh, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belgians. These were much more important for Polish Jews. Now, the question of bombing Auschwitz uh, the, it was raised with the Allies in the run-up to the invasion of France, and unfortunately, it's difficult for governments to do more than one thing at one time, and it really got passed over. After the invasion of France was successful, summer of 1944, the question was raised again. The British didn't have the right sort of planes to bomb Auschwitz, and they passed this on to the Americans. The assistant undersecretary for aviation, for, for, the, for, war, for war, for the Air Force, McCloy, turned this down. He, his son claims, McCloy is no longer alive, his son claimed in an interview about three years ago that uh, his father had told him on his deathbed that it was Roosevelt who said uh, that Auschwitz couldn't be bombed. The problem for Roosevelt was the belief that one must subordinate everything to winning the war and to divert any uh, strategic uh, weaponry to other objectives was wrong. That is one case where more could have been done. But by and large, the argument, which was uh, the Allied argument, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill's argument, that the Jews could best be saved by winning the war most quickly was probably, unfortunately, right, at least <coughs> after 1942-43. The fact is that seven million Jews were under Nazi occupation. One million of them survived. If the war had gone on another two years, very few of those would have survived. The period in which more could have been done is the period when America had not yet entered the war. As I always tell my students in America, America only came into the war in December 1941, as everybody knows. But in that period, America was still neutral. And certainly until the summer of 1941, the Germans were prepared to allow Jews, for instance in France, uh, to or Spain, to emigrate to the United States. The U.S. administration at that stage was worried about security. Roosevelt was worried about being re-elected. He did not admit very significant numbers. This, and there were a number of people in the U.S. consular service who tried to uh, get around this in various ways. But this was the period in which more could have been done. But once the Nazis were embarked on the policy of mass murder, which took place sometime in the autumn of 1941, the overwhelming power of the Nazis, the difficulty of reaching the areas involved, the difficulties which the Allies faced in the war meant that direct assistance to the Jews really wasn't that uh, uh, feasible. I think that uh, in a way what uh, Michael was pointing to, and this is a way the historiography has gone differently in the United States and in Britain to the historiography in France, the prevailing trend in the historiography on allied reactions here Rubinstein's book is a good example of this, uh, the new work in the United States on this, is to stress that Roosevelt was fundamentally sympathetic, but that he had to uh, deal with a hostile public opinion, and that militarily there was little more that he could have done. And Rubinstein argues the same about the British responses. Uh, the view that uh, the Allies somehow failed the Jews, uh, as Wyman argued, is no longer, at least as I understand it, widely accepted in, in U.S. historiography. I don't know whether, Michael, you agree on that. Um, well, it's, it, it's, not that it's, um, it's not that it's widely accepted among historians, but it's become part 
of sort of a political arsenal against Roosevelt, you know, against yeah, yeah, it, well, it's part well, of demonizing, part of demonizing but, but uh, just to, uh, um, just to put this into context, there were a couple, a couple things that are important for the background. Um, Jews, in terms of uh, being able to say anything about Jews generally in the United States, one of the things that they had been fighting for since they began to get sort of politically organized around the turn of the century was open immigration. And the thing that really separated them from almost any other immigrant group or labor group in the United States, and the only others who were sympathetic, were very um, disenfranchised or marginal people, more marginal than Jews, that is, people like Chinese and Japanese and Indians. These were the only people, along with Jews, who really wanted and fought for open immigration, and they lost that battle in 1924 that is, with the Johnson Acts. So anyone who had lived through that knew that America overwhelmingly was not open to any sort of, um, say, large or showy immigration. Now, there's something else that's going on that I think sometimes people don't pay all that much attention to. That is, um, Hitler said over and over and over again, and everyone knew this, he said, if a war happens, it's the Jews' fault. Um, and that Jews were, ver were a very big part of his worldview. And he said, if Britain gets into the war, it's because of the Jews. Or if the United States gets into the war, it's because of the Jews. And they said over and over and over again that the only reason why they're fighting this war is because Jews are pulling the strings and they're being manipulated. So in a lot of ways, the, both governments were very sensitive about doing or doing things or saying things that made it sound as if the war effort was in the Jewish interest. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, what does it matter what they were saying? But they were also concerned with their own populations being behind the war effort. So there is, it's a, it's a very messy picture, but in terms of his general sympathies, Roosevelt had mainly dealt with Jews in the United States and their concerns as people who were in the working class. And in that way, he could, he could hardly have been more sympathetic as far as Jews in Europe were concerned. This was, this was quite a ways down um, list of priorities. If I could just, we talked about novels. If I could mention one novel which actually gives you a good picture of some aspects of this, it's Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America, which describes how an isolationist president, Lindbergh, wins the election in 1940. Of course, being an American novel, it has a happy ending. Uh, <laughs> Lindbergh is pushed out and replaced by Roosevelt, and America gets into the war. But that gives you a picture of the atmosphere, which was very different from what it is today in the United States. I think we have. Hey, oh, uh, I think this one oh, was, so. was first. Yeah. I, um, I came to this talk because I was actually interested in Jan Karski, the man, um, less than the history surrounding him. Um, I think that for anyone who's, who's watched her eight hours in, Jan Karski is an extraordinary figure. He's an extraordinary figure for various reasons, um, partly because in a way he represents us, us who weren't there. Um, he's a witness, and he's a witness who, unlike the other witnesses in the film, sees things very, very personally and very much up close. Um, the film, his testimony about the Warsaw Ghetto is, is, is harrowing. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, really. Um, and although we all know about the Holocaust, you watch it again and it's still harrowing. It's still tremendously upsetting and might back up your point about Frankfurt, because however much we know about the Holocaust, it still is inconceivable that people could do this to other people. Um, that, for me, is the magic of Jan Karski. If you read the Lièvre de Patagonie, the, hair, the Patagonian hair, which is uh, which are Bansman's memories, the memoirs that are coming out in March in this country in English, um, Karski gives the interview in 1979. The film comes out in 1985. Throughout that period, he, get, he signed an exclusivity deal with Landsman. He wouldn't talk to anybody else. He wasn't prepared to, he wouldn't give any other comments about what the Jewish question or about what he had seen in, in Poland. But you notice within in the Lee of the Patagonie, 
that Karski is getting increasingly more and more desperate for this film to appear, increasingly more and more desperate to talk about that, that what he finally can actually say to himself and then say out loud is heard by a wider audience. And that uh, Landsman took, took five hours to, to edit, five years to edit this film, which suddenly works until it's inconceivable to me, um, uh, keeps on pushing him off. So I haven't got to you yet, I haven't done this yet. What, what effect did this have on the man? So I suspect you, Professor Polsky, you're the man who can answer this. <laughs> to actually have to finally come to a point where he can tell his story and then, wait far, then have to wait five, six years before actually people hear that story. And I know that Landsman has issues now with Karski about that, that discovery. I don't think that uh, Karski had any real problems with the delays in the film coming out because Lanzmann is a very charismatic figure. I think uh, Annette and I have both had our differences with him, so we have a less uh, um, sympathetic view of him. Uh, as a person, he can be uh, quite appalling. But I think, <laughs> I think in this case, there was a personal chemistry between the two of them, uh, which is reflected in the film. And, and uh, Karski understood what how Lanzmann was making the film. That, you know, the editing of the film, the Statue of Liberty and the withdrawal shot, for the long shot of the Statue of Liberty, the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, Karski lived in Washington. He knew what all these places meant. And the way in which, as he thought, Kars uh, uh, Lanzmann showed the hypocrisy which lay behind the American commitment to these universal values was something that he valued very much. Um, I mean, I hate to recommend books that you know people can't read, but uh, and there are some faults in the Andrzej Bikowski biography of Karski, but I think that that which is based on extensive interviews, which Bikowski lives in Poland but was in Washington in the 1990s, conducted with Karski, they give a pretty accurate picture of the way Karski was. I think that he changed uh, under the impact of uh, uh, Lanzmann. He began from being above all concerned to talk about the Polish diplomatic struggle for independence and the uh, betrayal, as he would have put it, and probably correctly, of Poland during the Second World War. He came to articulate these perhaps hidden or perhaps suppressed feelings about Jews, which go back a long way. You know, when he says, I've, I've said this pretty once, but he says, I didn't know anything about this. As I've tried to document, he knew a great deal about this, and it was very painful to him what he knew. And uh, he he just had this rapport with, with, uh, with Lanzmann, and that, of course, is one of Lanzmann's great uh, uh, virtues as a uh, gifts as a filmmaker, he he's able to strike these rapports. The the rapport which he struck with with Bomber, uh, this uh, person who is mentally challenged, as we now are supposed to say, but but who certainly could describe in very graphic way what happened to him is one of the most remarkable things about the film. I mean, the film starts with this, you, you're not sure what it is, this singing this Polish folk song, going in a punt uh, on the river, the, on the Nair River near Chelmno. You wonder what it is, but it develops into this remarkable scene. Uh, the film is a set of these uh, remarkable uh, uh, exchanges. Uh, and that that's, in this. I think in this case, the reason why uh, Karski went out on a limb in Polonia and in Polish society generally in saying what he said to uh, Maciej Kozlowski, which I read. This was not a popular view when Shoah came out in 1985. The overwhelming Polish response was this is the Polish government made a protest to the French government for having financed this anti-Polish uh, 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 provocation. Uh, I mean... So, and this was a view shared by the emigration. Karski went out on a limb, partly because he liked the film so much, but partly because he had this deep personal bond with Lanzmann, who allowed him somehow, like a psychiatrist, uh, allowed him to express these feelings, which were deeply in him, but which he, he wasn't able to express. I, that's how I would see it. With respect, that wasn't the question I asked, because if you read the book, Landsman says very clearly that Karski was endlessly asking him, when is it going to be shown? Where is I, I don't believe be? anything in Landsman's book. There's a description <laughs> in Landsman's book of the first showing of the of, of um, uh, uh, Shoah in Oxford. <laughs> Every word in it is false. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a question here. Just a note on the Landsman. 
just uh, just a couple of words on the, um, the relationship with Landsman that Kavsky had. Um, there's a record of the correspondence that uh, that uh, they exchanged in the very early 80s, and you're right, that there was an exclusivity deal which meant that he was not meant to speak. He could, in fact, uh, make uh, various speeches, uh, and uh, there were, he must have received some notifications from uh, Landsman's Phil companies, lawyers, because uh, there was then an exchange of uh, letters. And the significant thing, uh, significant thing about those exchange, that exchange is that uh, at one point, Kaski says, uh, I am being muzzled by you. Um, and uh, Landsman objected very strongly uh, to the use of, uh, to Kaski's use of the word muzzle, uh, and said, uh, unless you apologize, uh, we will no longer have any discussion. And that was the last thing that they ever said to each other. So, uh, this was 1982. The interview took place in October 1978. Uh, so, um, uh, Kowski waited about seven years before the, uh, the, the film came out in 85, and it was only after that that he was, as it were, unmuzzled. Can I just say a couple of, uh, just one thing that, uh, that uh, um, one thing that uh, is, I think, important in the Karski story is that when he arrived in London in uh, late November 1942, um, he was, first of all, uh, a member of the Polish government in exile. So he was, uh, if you like, uh, he was at the Pole working for the government um, based here in London. And um, he, at, that age, at that time, 42, he was uh, 28. Um, he, presented whatever it was that he was carrying, the reports that he was carrying, uh, to the Polish government and the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, the, the, and it was then edited and used to uh, make a, a report uh, to the, uh, the, primarily the British government. And it is probably important to stress that it is that report, it is what Kowalski brought, which may have then uh, through the, the, uh, the Polish Foreign Ministry's uh, uh, official report, which would then uh, led to the December 17th declaration, uh, which specifically recognized the extermination of the Jews. So this was, uh, that was the point at which you could say that the Allies officially knew that the extermination of the Jews is taking place. So that's the United Nations, uh, as they were called, the Allies were called, declaration of uh, December 17th, uh, uh, 1942. Uh, it's normally regarded, it's normally thought that it was Karski and then the uh, Polish government on the basis of what Karski brought that brought that uh, declaration uh, about, although there's controversy because uh, and, and I, I won't mention Engel and, and so on as to whether or not it was Karski, but that's an important part of that whole story that there's a point at which uh, the world knew that the, the extermination is taking place and the point at which it became official, uh, as it were, and that was the, and I think that that, that declaration is normally taken to be at that point. And Kasky had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Yes, I agree, yeah. absolutely. Sir, can I make another point if nobody else? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, there's another point, um, and this uh, relates to, to, to Frankfurter, uh, uh, and it's to do with uh, dates because they are important and also they are important uh, to the controversy uh, uh, in, in France um, uh, between Landsman and Hanna. Um, and, uh, and the dates are important because the meeting with Frankfurter was on the evening of uh, July the 5th, 1942. Uh, the meeting with uh, Roosevelt was uh, on July the 28th, so it's about two weeks later. A few days after the meeting uh, with, uh, uh, with, with Frankfurt, so that's a July 5th meeting, uh, the Polish ambassador, Czernowski, uh, wrote a report in which he, uh, and it was a report written to the, as an ambassador, he wrote it to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the foreign minister in, in London. Uh, and that report states that it was a successful meeting. They met uh, all the important people. And in fact, a couple of days later, he got a note, he received a note from Frankfurter uh, arranging a meeting uh, with uh, Roosevelt. Uh, and that's an important part to, oh, to, to that's a, it's important for the, for the, <coughs> the, the row, let's call it, between Hanel 
and, and Landsman because it means actually that uh, Frankfurt was very keen for, uh, for Karski to speak to um, uh, De Roosevelt. Uh, and if that is the case, then what the meaning of uh, the, the Frankfurt remark about, uh, the, the, about the, the not calling him a liar but not un unable to believe is, is quite mysterious. And I think that the explanation is the one that, that, that you gave, Michael, that as, as he just couldn't conceive it. Uh, uh, given given, given what, what he knows. All right. uh, on that note, thank you so much, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to interrupt. I'm sure that you can come and talk up to the speakers uh, afterwards. But it, what you're doing a PhD? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Thank especially the three speakers. I think Miles Taylor has a few words to say before you all go. Um, but I think we can all give a round of applause for the moment, too. Hello, everyone. I'm Miles Taylor, Director of the Institute of Historical Research. On the coldest night of the year, I'm not going to keep you very long, just to say that we are very, very pleased to host the second Holocaust Memorial Lecture. We're very grateful to the Bears Institute for assembling such a distinguished panel of speakers and for, for them for making the effort to come here tonight. To you all for being here, asking such stimulating questions. And I'm sorry that the room wasn't warmer. Thank you all very much for a nice journey. <laughs>